Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's live stream presentation, The Power is Yours, Taking Action Against Climate Change. This is part two of a three-part series of programs created by the Los Alamos Resiliency, Energy, and Sustainability Task Force. I am Ashley Lusher, the Gift Shop and Program Coordinator at Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be your moderator for tonight's event. This presentation is being recorded. PEAK is a nonprofit that operates in the Los Alamos Nature Center, which is open from 10 to four, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Please visit our website, peatnature.org, to learn more about visiting the Nature Center and our other upcoming events. We are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So I'd like to send a special shout out to you for your generous support. To learn more details about becoming a PEAK member or donor, please visit peaknature.org. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, I'm Katie Leonard, Chair of the Los Alamos Resiliency, Energy and Sustainability Task Force. Our task force was formed from a citizen petition asking the county council to take action on climate change. We will highlight a few of our recommendations at the end of tonight's presentation. With me tonight, uh, I was introduced as Vice Chair Robert Gibson, Member Sue Barnes, Subcommittee Member Daniel Leonard, and County Council Chair Randall Wrighty. Thank you for being here, everybody. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this is the second of three events we're hosting. And here's what you can expect out of tonight's program. Next slide. A vocabulary overview, an explanation of batteries versus fuel cells, how to recycle right, things you can do, individual actions to reduce your carbon footprint, including reducing food waste and a plant-rich diet and more. Um, a brief review of the COP26 meeting. Uh, the Lorez Task Force recommendation highlights, and then information on how to contact lawmakers. We will be happy to take your questions at the end, so please save them until that time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we'll start with a little climate change vocabulary. We went over these last time, but not all of you may have been with us. So using the chat feature, please type in your own definition of the term anthropogenic. We'll give it just a second for some responses to come through. Don't be shy. Nobody? Okay. Well, there we go. All right, we got a couple going on there. Great. Uh, I'm gonna pick Caroline Blackburn since it's created by human. Yeah, man-made um, is, is um, anthropogenics. Thank you for all of those other responses. Maybe I'll wait just a little longer. Um, the next one is photovoltaic. Go ahead and type in what you think that term means. See, we have some people who are more specific than others. That's great. Um, I'm gonna take that sun-powered energy. Um, it's basically uh, energy from the sun. The voltaic is the energy or the, uh, electricity and the, the photo is the sun. Uh, well done. Um, so the next one is greenhouse gases. And instead of defining um, the term, I'd like you to type in all the greenhouse gases you can think of. And it doesn't have to be fancy terminology. You can type it in however seems best to you. And so just to be, um, Maybe a little bit more clear, we're looking for like the actual gases themselves. Yeah, I see a lot of good, a lot of good answers coming up through here. Yeah, good. So Elizabeth Watts has uh, carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, nitrous oxides. Um, other people have water vapor, which is true. Um, those are great. Uh, I would only add maybe like hydrofluorocarbons. Um, all right. And then we have the term ocean acidification. And my question for the chat is, why does that matter? What does it do? Ocean acidification, how does that impact the oceans? So 
I'll just let a couple more answers come through. Oh, these are good. Nice. Uh, so Joni uh, says it lowers the pH of the ocean water, which is true. That's the acidification part. And then uh, Erica Harding, it deteriorates the aquatic life. Um, and what it does is it that changes the chemical structure of the stuff and some of the crustaceans, like they can't build their shells or their exoskeletons or the corals can't um, calcify properly. So those are great. Thank you for all the, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, thank you for all these great responses. And then the last thing is deforestation. And I'd like you to put in the chat um, why forests are being cut down. There are many ways uh, many reasons why forests are being deforested. Yep, yep, all of these things. Yeah, so farming oftentimes are these cash crops that are like real quick to grow and sell. Um, soybeans, corn, things like that. A lot of times it's cattle, agriculture. Yep, way to go, Sue Barnes. Uh, also, um, logging is one of them, um, grazing, uh, creating grassland for cattle. That was Judy's good job. Lumber from Barbara. Yep. Clear the land for development. Yeah. These are all really great responses. So thank you for those. Um, our new terms tonight are going to be battery fuel cell, therm, watt, kilowatt, megawatt, gigawatt. Uh, and there's a few others. Uh, let me just close out the chat and make sure I have, um, my thing here. There we go. Um, so for this, I'll turn it over to Daniel Leonard, uh, a fuel scientist at LANL. Um, and I will let you do this. And I think Ashley, he'll want that next slide. So take it away, Dan. <clears throat> Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today I'd like to just present a little bit of in basic information on how batteries fuel cell and fuel cells work and also a little bit of dimensional analysis and how you can use that to understand your own carbon footprint. Um, so go ahead, next slide. So first, uh, we'll talk about lithium ion batteries. You can see on the left is my little cartoon of how a lithium ion battery works. Uh, you have the green circles, those are the lithium ions themselves, and then you have electrons uh, on the anode side of a battery, which is the negative, the negative pole, on the anode side of a battery, you have uh, lithium ions, and you and they sit in between two layers of graphite or graphene, actually. But the layer, the graphite itself hosts the lithium ions. The anode then gives up its electrons to the cathode, and the uh, electrons go through the circuit. The ions go across the battery and get transported through the separator, which is just there to keep the anode and cathode from touching each other and creating a short circuit. And then they get inserted into the cathode material. So this might be the iron phosphate or the uh, cobalt oxide or some of the other minerals that some of the other chemistries that you might have heard about in the news. Um, batteries are great. They have very high efficiencies, 80 to 90% in round trip efficiency but their specific power output is not very, not very much. So batteries themselves are fairly heavy compared to uh, say a fuel. And uh, most of that weight doesn't give you any uh, push, doesn't give you any power. So for a lot of things like uh, short distance transport, um, most people's commutes, that sort of thing, a battery electric vehicle would be great. But if you wanna do long um, distance transport, moving heavy objects like a train or, tr or a trucking, you need to have another, another uh, method of moving. So the main reason is because the capacity of a battery scales linearly with the battery size. So if you have a battery of a given power output, if you wanna go twice as far, you need a battery that's twice as big. And if you, the, the size and weight of those batteries due to their low uh, specific power output gets pretty big. Uh, pretty fast. Um, there's also some other issues with batteries and that one being the depth of discharge. So the amount of energy you can actually get out of your pack um, is limited in order to prevent irreversible damage to the battery itself. Uh, you've probably heard that you shouldn't discharge your phone battery all the way before you charge it again. Um, that's just to protect the battery itself. And 
And on top of that, every time you charge and discharge a battery, you wind up reducing its total capacity over time. Uh, so each time you get just a little bit less energy out of it. Uh, there are some games you can play with, with how much of the capacity you use, but then you're using, then you have basically less of a battery than you thought you did. Um, and then charging is slow compared to other vehicles. So we're used to just filling up our gas tank in you know, three to five minutes. Whereas even with rapid charging, it takes quite a bit longer uh, to fill up a uh, battery electric. Uh, next slide, please. So another option for transport and for uh, heavy duty uh, applications are hydrogen fuel cells. And if you click one more time, we'll see a little animation of what happens in a hydrogen fuel cell. So the hydrogen comes in on the anode side, reacts with with the catalyst to give up its electron. The electron goes through the circuit to power whatever you're looking, whatever you have it connected to, and then uh, attaches, to the, attaches to the oxygen. And then the um, hydrogen ions get transported across the membrane in order to uh, finish the reaction. And the resulting uh, reactant or the resulting product is only water. Um, there's lots of applications for these in heavy duty transport, uh, like trains or trucking. Um, that's the main, uh, and even aviation in some cases. And the, to the total power output or the specific output is much higher than a battery. So by like an order of magnitude. Before we were like around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 kilowatts per kilogram. Current fuel cells are around five kilowatts per kilogram. They have lower efficiencies than batteries, but it really all depends on what you need to do. Um, most of that, you can get all of the energy out of your fuel cell uh, based on burning all of your, uh, all of your available fuel. Uh, fueling is fast, just like regular vehicles. And your range is only limited by the amount of hydrogen that you can carry. Um, I know this is a pretty brief uh, introduction, but um, things are pretty exciting in hydrogen these days. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some basic units uh, and the concepts behind them and how you can use them to understand your carbon footprint. So the first two ideas really are power and energy. Power is the rate at which you can transfer energy and energy itself is the thing that's transferred to do work on an object. So if you wanted to heat up an object, you have to put energy into it. And power is how fast you're putting that energy into something. So some common units for power would be like megawatts or kilowatts, and common units for energy are like BTUs, therms, kilowatt hours, that sort of thing. Uh, so next slide, please. So quickly, some using these units, uh, some definitions. Uh, a BTU is the amount of energy you need to, to put into a pound of water to change it one degree Fahrenheit. Uh, a therm is 100,000 BTUs. And then a kilowatt hour is an amount of energy expended over an hour. So if you had a power output of one kilowatt and you sustain that for one hour, you used one kilowatt worth of energy. If you used two kilowatts worth of power over half an hour, you still used only one kilowatt worth of energy. And then kilograms or kg of CO2, that's just carbon, kilograms of carbon dioxide. So I took my last power bill and, cal and uh, calculated how much CO2 we produced just keeping our house warm. Uh, so we used 122 therms to, of natural gas, and that resulted in a total carbon output of 600, almost 650 kilograms of CO2. Um, that I don't, this is the first time I've done this calculation for myself. So <laughs> it seems like a lot of CO2 to me. And we don't keep our house that warm. It's only set to 66. Um, but using these sorts of ideas, or using these units and using these ideas, you can actually look at your own, uh, take your own power bill, convert it into carbon dioxide, amount of carbon dioxide, and you can see where you stand to make the most benefit in changing your behavior or say uh, in your next upgrade on your own carbon footprint. Um, with that, I'll hand it off to to Katie. 
Next slide, please. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> okay, um, fuel cells and batteries are big scale changes and like electric vehicles and solar panels, those are big investments. Big changes are good and important, but they can also be expensive and intimidating. And so we as individuals might want more medium and small scale actions to take in our own lives. Next, uh, this slide is fine actually. <clears throat> we all know about reduce, reuse, recycle. And the emphasis really should be in that order. Uh, reduce first, reuse as much as you can, and then when you can't use it anymore, recycle it. However, there are many more things we can do than just this, these three. Next slide. Rethinking really is the key to making change. I would be willing to bet that most of you have at least one reusable mug uh, or water bottle in your kitchen. Uh, pandemic notwithstanding, how many times have you gone to a coffee shop and thought, oh, I should have brought my reusable mug, right? I've done it. Uh, creating a habit takes time and commitment. If you regularly bring your reusable grocery shopping, shopping bags uh, to the store, congratulations, you've created a habit. Uh, now we need to do this for lots of things. Um, we also need to refuse and reduce. And this means needs versus wants. Uh, how much do I really need? How much stuff? We do need stuff. Uh, and the stuff we have might be able to be repaired or refurbished before getting something new. Although some things are not the way they used to be. Uh, sometimes it's hardly worth repairing when the new one costs basically as much as the repair does. Or sometimes it's just easier to get the new one. Um, I get it. Uh, but there are some easy things we can do to use a little less and to make things last a little longer. And, you know, thousands of people, millions of people doing all these little changes does add up. Next slide, please. Repairing clothes, for example, patching your jeans or your shirt, sewing up holes in clothes, these can extend the life of your garments and also save you money. Next slide. Reusing shirts and socks for cleaning rags, um, reusing dish towels as hanky, like cutting them into smaller sizes, uh, reusing jars for all kinds of things uh, is very helpful, not just recycling them. Uh, next slide. I think many of us uh, reuse simple things like Ziploc baggies. Uh, we wash and reuse them. Here are some creative drying racks uh, that I've seen. The top one is a colander with chopsticks in it, which seems to work really well. Um, cloth rags versus paper towels um, oftentimes work better. Um, I would issue you the paper towel, towel challenge for this new year. Can you use just one roll this year? Choose wisely. Um, other reusable items can help keep waste out of the landfill and also be convenient when you need them. Next slide. Uh, gifting or rehoming isn't on this list, but there are many ways to give your unused or unwanted items uh, another chance at being useful. The internet is a great tool for finding somebody who might want your stuff. Facebook buy nothing sites, online yard sales, um, Fine if you don't like Facebook or don't want to use it. There are other ways to gift things out there. There's a site called Free Cycle. Um, and I've, gosh, I picked up like National Geographic magazines for my classroom. All kinds of stuff is on Free Cycle. Um, Craigslist is good too. You can set it out on the curb. You can give things in good condition to Habitat for Humanity, a shelter, an animal rescue society. Um, there are lots of ways that things can be sort of reused rather than just going to the dump. Next slide. But sometimes things just need to be recycled. Empty, clean, and dry is the key. No liquids remaining in the plastic container, milk, juice, soda, laundry, soap. No food or grease on paper or plastic or metal. Food and drink contaminate the recycling stream. It's clean if everything is clean, um, but dirty recycling really is just trash. Um, give it a quick rinse. If it's dirty, throw it away. And I know that feels terrible. Um, but the truth is recycling is such a small portion. It feels like something tangible we can do, but when in doubt, throw it out. It's much better to throw it away than to contaminate the clean recycling stream. Uh, empty, clean, and dry. And dry because wet starts to deteriorate the paper, uh, which makes it weaker when they take it to the mill to repulp it for other purposes. Uh, in terms of paper, no paper towels or tissues, yuck. 
uh, or tissue paper. Uh, these are usually dirty and the fiber content is too low to be repulped into usable paper. So those things should just be thrown away or composted um, in your own garden. Uh, corrugated cardboard is like the gold. It's the most valuable recyclable paper good. Uh, please break down your boxes to save space in your cart and therefore gas, meaning there's more space in the recycling truck. Um, no styrofoam of any kind. It has a triangle on it. It actually doesn't mean that that's recyclable. Uh, no plastic wrapping on anything, no plastic bags in your cart. You can take your plastic bags to Smith's as long as they're clean and empty. Um, these are soft plastics. If you could push your finger through, that's a soft plastic and those can any kind of like bread bags or something like that, those can go in that. Uh, no granola bar wrappers, chip bags, fast food, anything. Wish cycling, you may know this term. Uh, this is when you're not sure if it should be recycled, but you want to, if you can. So we do, and oftentimes it's actually just trash. Um, so when in doubt, throw it out. If you have questions about what is recyclable, my best suggestion is to download the Recycle Coach app, which will tell you what is specifically recyclable in Los Alamos County. Uh, Recycling is tricky because it's different everywhere. It's different in Albuquerque, it's different in Oregon and Texas. Um, so download the Recycle Coach app and you can type in, is this recyclable? Next slide. Another good habit to start is taking the bus. Carpooling, walking, or biking to get around. I know that driving yourself is the most convenient way to go, uh, but consider once a month, once a week. Start small. Um, I'm gonna attempt to click on this hyperlink in the slide, or maybe um, Ashley, if you could click on Atomic City Transit for me, please. We'll see if it goes to the website. That's okay, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, if you go to the Atomic City Transit website, you just Google it or go to the county page, it will show you routes and times for all of the buses. Uh, you can click on this thing called the ACT tracker, which will show you a specific route, it kind of highlights it, and then it shows you like where the bus is exactly when you're looking and um, it's live. Uh, so you can like, oh, I got two minutes to go catch the bus or whatever, I got an hour. Um, and then you can also plan a trip. There's a little like plan my trip thing to click on there. If the bus isn't your thing, maybe make a little extra time to walk or bike to your destination. Uh, it's also a good way to get exercise, of course. Uh, next slide. I could spend an hour talking about all the things you could do, um, but these are just some other small things. Um, so maybe they seem obvious, but if you don't actually do them, then you can't reduce your carbon footprint. Um, turning off the lights or electronics when you're not using them, when you leave the room, uh, lowering your thermostat by one or two degrees in the winter or putting it up a little bit in the summer, this really does make a big difference energy-wise and also in your utility bill. Uh, weather stripping, leaky doors or windows. I just did this last week. It makes a big difference. Not running the water while you do dishes or brush your teeth. Sometimes we're just in the habit of doing those things, but trying to be conscious of it. Uh, maybe not flushing every time. I know that's controversial. Uh, if your hot water takes a while to reach the kitchen, fill a bowl or a basin with the cold water until it warms and use the water for other things. Um, or bring your bowl closer to the source. I bring my little dish tub into the bathroom and I fill it with hot water. Um, don't idle your vehicle. Research has been done on this by Argonne National Lab. And if you're gonna idle longer than 10 seconds, you, it's better just to turn off the car. Uh, these things save resources, reduce pollution, and they save you money too. Next slide. So those are some small, here's what I can start doing, tips. Uh, I'd like to just take five seconds to set a little intention. What am I gonna start with? Next slide. Next up, we have Sue Barnes to talk about food waste reduction and plant-rich diets. Take it away, Sue. Thanks very much, Katie. Um, a great introduction to the things that we can do at home to reduce our um, carbon footprint. And tonight I wanna briefly tell you about why you should care about food if you care about climate change, uh, or you care about water, or wildlife, or your health, or your budget, or really 
any one of a bunch of important issues. Um, and I also want to share with you some ideas and resources on how to make changes in your food print to reduce emissions, waste, hunger, and so many other things. Let's start with why food matters for the climate. Um, as you can see in this chart from Project Drawdown over on the right-hand side, food production really accounts for a big chunk of our global emissions, 24% uh, or so, about the same or more than electricity production and transportation. And why is that? Um, it's, it's mostly because we produce so much food to feed our now 8 billion people and because agriculture has many sources of greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. These include land disturbance, um, we already discussed, discussed deforestation, uh, pollution from fertilizers and pesticides, processing, transport, and sale of food, and the infamous methane released in cow burps. Um, so there's lots of sources from lots of food production, and all of that adds up to lots of emissions. Next slide, please. In fact, Project Drawdown has placed reducing food waste and shifting towards plant-rich diets at the top of their solutions for reducing anthropogenic carbon in the atmosphere. And that's shown here in the two green bars on the left side of the graph. You can see that these solutions actually dwarf some of the better known solutions um, like utility scale solar and electric cars uh, in their um, potential to reduce greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. Let's talk about food waste first. Um, the stats around this are really pretty shocking. Globally, about a third of the pro food produced is wasted, and the US is among the biggest wasters of food. About 35% of the food that we produce um, goes uneaten. This has tremendous costs, including at the household level. Uh, about 25% of food purchased by consumers, by you and me, uh, is thrown away. So that's like walking out of Smith's with four bags of groceries and dropping one in the parking lot for the Ravens to eat. Um, this adds up to more than $1,500 lost every year for a family of four. Next slide, please. Our stats for Los Alamos are also pretty shocking. Um, in 2019, residents sent more than 1.6 million pounds of food to the landfill. And studies have shown that about 70% of food that's thrown out is or should have been edible food. So not bones and pits and peels, but food that could have been eaten but was trashed instead because people bought too much or the kids didn't like it or it got shoved to the back of the fridge and became a science experiment. That 70% of our food waste works out to more than one and a half tons of edible food sent to the landfill every single day. And that's just from residents. That's not counting our grocery stores, our schools, and our restaurants. At the landfill, the problems continue. Um, food waste makes methane, which is a greenhouse gas that's 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide in trapping heat and accelerating climate change. And in 2018, the county had to spend over a million dollars to install a methane capture system on our landfill. The greenhouse gases released in the production of our wasted food was the equivalent of over 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide and 165 million gallons of water went into producing that, fin fill that, that food that we trashed. So the amount of food that we waste in Los Alamos is pretty shocking. It's pretty harmful. It's also pretty expensive. I should say it's pretty average though. It's not that, it's not that we're doing a terrible job. It's just, this is the, the state of, of food waste in, in, the, in the US and much of the world. Next slide, please. The good news is that there are many things that we can do every day to reduce the amount of food that we waste. And we all waste food. Let's, I waste food, you waste food, everybody wastes food. Um, most of these are pretty basic and hopefully some are things that you're already doing. Um, things like planning your meals before you go shopping. Shop your kitchen first. Take a look at what you have in the pantry and the fridge and plan your meals around that and then make a shopping list of the other things you need to buy. When you get to the grocery store, stick to your list. 
Um, don't shop hungry, you probably know that. And especially avoid the buy one, get one free offers, which are really just scams des designed to encourage you to spend more money to buy more food that you probably don't actually need. Um, back home, store your food properly in the fridge, freezer, or pantry. Many things can be stir stored long-term frozen, including things you might not think about like milk, cheese, and bread. Before those things go bad, pop them into the freezer um, and next time you need some, you can, you can use them. When you cook, try to use all of whatever you're cooking. Plan for your leftovers, keep them in, front, in the front of your fridge or your freezer and eat them. And this goes for food you've brought home from restaurants too. For the small amount of food that you don't use, you can donate non-perishables to food banks or some of the little pantries around town and compost the rest at home or perhaps at a neighbor's. There are wonderful resources online to help with all of this. Um, Savethefood.com is really a one-stop shop of great information and tools like the Meal Prep Mate that can help with all of these things. Our zero waste team has compiled a bunch of resources that are on the um, Environmental Services website shown here, and you can go to there, including seeing a, a, a video of an hour-long presentation of this if you want to get much further down into the weeds on it. And we've even put together a great kit with shopping lists and food storage guides and a family food waste prevention pledge um, that you can pick up at the Nature Center next time you stop in. So we encourage you to take some steps to reduce wasting food in your household, your workplace, your school, your church, at restaurants, or wherever you buy and consume food. Next slide, please. So what about food choices? Um, impactful action here is really pretty simple. Shift towards a plant-rich diet. Reduce consumption of animal source proteins in favor of plant-based proteins. There have been many recent studies that look at the climate impact of various foods and they all come up with the same basic res results. Um, the production of meat, dairy, eggs, poultry, and seafood at the, shown in the top bars of this graph has an outsized impact on greenhouse gas emissions compared to production of plant foods. Meat and dairy from ruminant animals such as cows and sheep are particularly problematic. And this is true pretty much regardless of how the animals are raised. Um, there are tons of resources online elsewhere and, and elsewhere to help you make this shift in your diet. Next slide, please. And we can see again the potential impact of shifting towards a more plant-rich diets uh, in the second bar of this graph on the left-hand side. Um, next slide, please. In addition to greenhouse gases, I, I really love working on food as a climate solution because it's so much more than that. Our food system impacts almost every aspect of our environment, of our civilization, and of our lives in very big ways. We use half of all our habitable land on Earth for food production, and when we waste food or grow food unsustainability, un unsustainably, we waste that land. Most of our fresh water goes to growing food, and as a result, food waste alone wastes 25% of our drinking water. When we grow food unsustainably or in the wrong places, we kill plants and animals, leading to species decline and extinction. Food waste and unhealthy eating cost individual states and nations trillions of dollars every year. And all of this is going to get worse as our population expands beyond 9 billion by mid-century unless we change what we do around food. So in addition, if you need a bit of personal inspiration in these pandemic times, um, note also that health, health outcomes are increasingly linked to food choices and the environment. For instance, a recent PNAS paper found that foods associated with improved adult health also have low environmental impacts. Shifting from the red foods on this uh, graph to more of the green foods can help immensely with chronic diseases, as both myself and my husband have, have personally experienced. Of course, this is no surprise to anyone whose parents or doctors have suggested that they should consider eating more fruits and veggies. Next slide, please. So there are many monikers for people who shift their diets to more 
plant foods. The old standards are vegetarians and vegans. Some new terms that I've heard are flexitarians and reducitarians. And I don't know what you call people who reduce their food waste other than saints, um, but I like the catchy title climatarium for someone who changes their habits to help around food to help the climate. So how do you do this? Um, we have food habits that we've acquired over many years and that we practice every day. But again, this means we have many opportunities for change if we just start paying attention. You can take little bites or big ones. I mean, if you're the type of person who likes to go big, this is Veganuary. And you can find resources online um, to take a 31-day challenge to go plant-based this month and become vegan in a month. Um, but many people find it easier to just start with a small change or two every week or month. Um, how about Meatless Mondays, for instance, like they have implemented, they've implemented it the, in the New York City school systems. Um, there's countless resources in the, on the internet for shifting to a more plant-rich diet. The, the library gets new vegetarian and vegan cookbooks in every month. And if you're lucky at the end of today's presentation, you may win a vegetarian cookbook to get started with. So also you wanna be celebrating small changes. You know, If you make changes and you've saved money or you feel better or you find you're producing less waste, Pay attention to these benefits because that's what's gonna keep you going in the long run. And finally, talk it up. Talk about the changes you've made or are trying to make. Talk with your family, friends, and coworkers and spread the word about the importance of food. Next slide, please. So that's it for me, a whirlwind tour of how and why you might use food to fight climate change. Thank you for caring about food. Back to you, Katie. Thank you, Sue. I am always so inspired by your talks. Um, and it occurs to me too, that the first time I heard Sue talk about this, I was like, I don't waste food. And then I paid attention and I do. Uh, the lettuce gets yucky or the cilantro, I only used a tablespoon of it and became a science experiment in the drawer. And um, I pay a lot more attention now. Um, and that's largely thanks to Sue Barnes. Um, most of the questions we're going to take at the very end, but I did just, uh, have somebody ask about like locally sourced meats. And I read an article not too long ago and it was like, it's better to buy apples from China than beef from like the state next to you. And I was like, Whoa. Um, so it, it really does matter. Um, and obviously you have uh, like transportation and stuff to, to factor in, but really it's, it's all the other things. Um, so with that, um, we have, uh, Randall Wrighty, chair of the County Council here to talk about his experience at COP26. We can move to the next slide and thanks Randy for being here and we'll let you get, uh, get started here. Probably next slide. Probably next one, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Katie, and thanks for inviting me to come and just share a few thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> and people had noticed I'd actually prepared a report for the county council, so I just took a few highlights, and then for the council, it was just kind of a report of text. I had a lot of links in there to other information, but I thought it'd be uh, more interesting to show some photographs um, from, from being at the conference in Glasgow. So uh, Conference of the Parties, COP26. Um, it's obviously an international conference. Um, and so uh, we got to go as representing the Coalition of Sustainable Communities New Mexico, which uh, Los Alamos County joined as a result of a recommendation from the task force, the La Res task force. So I just wanted to mention that too. So uh, the, the, the questions about, you know, what's the relevance to local governments? Well, it is an international co conference, so there's nation states represented and they're doing negotiations on you know, the national goals uh, for the climate. Uh, but there's also non-governmental organizations represented like the coalition. Uh, there's also business community represented and based on comments from people attending past COPs, there was more business representation. There's also state and local governments represented, uh, whether it's from you know, North America or around the world. So you do get to see what other uh, communities are doing, what things have worked, um, and you know what kinds of what kinds of ideas look like they have some 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 merit. And so just for this, just uh, one in the pavilion area, they had a pavilion for the nation of Tuvalu, and uh, that's what's on the left. And then uh, on the right is a screenshot of the prime minister of Tuvalu uh, speaking to some folks uh, towards the end of the of the conference. Go to the next slide, please. 
And I think another thing, um, just to highlight for here, uh, there are a lot of pavilions and presentations on science. Uh, so this is just a couple of examples uh, where we had some science presentations. So this Bolin Center for Cryosphere Research uh, had a lot of excellent materials. I just, this is just, a, you can't read the material in there, but I have a link in my report to uh, some of this material. So there's really a great report uh, that um, some of the modeling simulations they looked at was actually the acidification of the ocean, uh, which was one of the questions that uh, uh, Katie asked about. And, and just uh, when you look at the science and some of the data, it, it is a fairly sobering uh, kind of view. Uh, the NASA had a hyperwall presentation. It's a series of LCDs where they could show some really interesting graphical presentations. Uh, this one on the right. Uh, the bottom right is um, just some modeling that was uh, 1858 to 2018. And so it's a fairly recent. And the topic was really look what what's been happening in the recent times. So in about the last 25, 30 years. And that's where you can really see a departure um, resulting from anthropogenic, another one of the terms heard today. So I think people are pretty familiar with that at this point. So it was a really interesting presentation. Again, uh, look at get this information. It is very sobering. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, there are things that people are doing. And so I did want to talk a little bit about, in particular, what we saw in Glasgow. Uh, so the next slide. So uh, there were uh, uh, electric vehicle charging stations uh, right on the public streets. And uh, people would just uh, use a payment method, a credit card or a phone, and they could uh, get a you know, certain amount of time on the charging device. And uh, so I thought that was really interesting to see that just basically sitting there. And uh, you can kind of tell they, they're not, they don't look like they're new. So they've been there for a while. So like a lot of uh, US cities, but I think that's one thing to look at is what is being done internationally in different cities. Uh, in the top, um, Top right, it's a mural on the street. And I just thought this one was interesting. Uh, Glasgow has a lot of uh, murals around the city. And this one is uh, demonstrating, you know, going from, uh, you know, blowing on a dandelion to um, um, turbines, wind turbines. And so that's kind of a, I think these are more hopeful messages. Um, and then they're at the airport, uh, there was some interesting art for COP26. And so this is a piece of art at the installation there uh, with a young woman in, in front of a burning forest and just kind of with the urgency necessary to be uh, taking some action. So, and I think, yeah, in, in, in general, uh, you know, people wonder, you know, what, what's the experience of COP? Do you come back feeling hopeful or not? And, and I think you do feel hopeful. I mean, there's a lot of good information about what's going on, uh, more certainty that we have in, in the modeling and the science and a big commitment from a lot of parties, uh, from nation states all the way down to uh, individual cities. And so I think that just is a good segue to what, uh, you know, I think the, uh, what Rez is proposing. And uh, I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it uh, back, I guess, to Katie to moderate. Uh, Thanks, Randy. Um, Next, we have Robert Gibson, Vice Chair of the LaRez Task Force, to give you uh, some highlights of our final report recommendations. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you, Katie. Uh, let's see, am I on here? Are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. All right. Uh, a year ago, the County Council appointed a task force called the Resiliency, Energy and Sustainability Task Force to look comprehensively at our uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and what could be done to reduce them. We as a community contribute around 200,000 metric tons per year of carbon dioxide equivalent into the atmosphere. And we'd like to get that down to a, a much lower value. Uh, we were given a year to do that job, and our report is due at the end of this month. We broke our work down into several different categories, and you can see those categories listed here. And I will go through each one of these and hit some of the highlights of our recommendations to Council. Next slide, please. Okay, general recommendations start with establishing a net zero goal. That means 200,000 tons down to zero net over uh, at, at some point in time, it won't be next year, but sometime. 
uh, to get there, we got to know for sure where we really are. Uh, the uh, actually the numbers are more than 200,000 tons because that doesn't include everything, including a lot of the things Sue talked about. Uh, we need a, uh, a more detailed emission study. And from that, we can set emission targets and we need to uh, uh, create and adopt a climate change action plan to make it all happen. The, we need to, to track the, the, uh, what we're doing. And uh, so we're recommending a report to council and the community every year. And this will go on for quite a while, I'm sure. Uh, this will require some county staff to do it. We're suggesting a sustainability coordinator and probably some other staff to do it. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll start with the natural gas reduction. Uh, natural gas is uh, largely methane. When it leaks into the atmosphere, it's a bad actor, as already pointed out. When it's burned, it produces carbon dioxide, so you lose either way. The uh, Utilities Board has set a goal to phase out natural gas in this community by 2070. Um, and that's a big step because every building in the community is heated by natural gas, almost everyone. Uh, we, can, we can't put it off till for 40 years and say, oh, now we're gonna do all, everything in 10 years. We're suggesting an interim uh, series of goals of reducing our use by at least 2% every year. How do we do that? Uh, well, it's easier when we start with new construction, where there isn't a lot of it, but we need to start there. Uh, buildings can be designed differently than they have been, compact architectures, which we're being driven to by land shortages anyway, solar access and solar heating. At some point here, we're going to have to set a date, or we, at least we recommend setting a date, after which there will be no new natural gas hookups. Uh, that sounds draconian, but actually some buildings are being built in town right now without natural gas, uh, and that's without being forced by the government to do so. So it's, it's not far away. Uh, for new and existing buildings, there's three key words, how you reduce the heat, uh, heating needs, or reduce the gas needs. One of those words is insulation. Better insulation, which also includes particularly better windows and doors, and reducing infiltration, which is heat loss, uh, air, air uh, leakage, excuse me. Uh, around windows and doors in many cases, but through a lot of other things. And the other big change is heat pumps. Uh, heat pumps are kind of like a refrigerator and air conditioner. Those are heat pumps, but heat pumps can work both ways. And uh, they can heat buildings as well as cool them. And they're electric and they're much more efficient than traditional electric heating is. Uh, we can also replace water heaters, either with solar water heaters or uh, heat pumps. And there's some other options also. And it, what works best in a given property, a given house is gonna depend on, on a lot of different things. Uh, the traditional cook stove, gas or electric, can be replaced with induction ranges. People who have them really like them. Uh, of course, it, they would replace the gas ranges. They're also, in many respects, uh, uh, they have a lot of the advantages of gas ranges in terms of fast heating and other things with respect to uh, traditional electric stoves. They're more efficient than both. The lowly pilot light sits there and burns 24 seven. We don't tend to think about it, but we really shouldn't be uh, installing appliances with any new ones. And some, uh, some appliances that still have them can be retrofit with a spark ignition, not all. Um, a lot of people don't know where to start and aren't gonna know where to start. And we are recommending that the county make energy audits and other individualized support available through the utilities department. Next slide. Okay, electricity is the one everybody thinks about, although gas is almost as much of an issue, um, but uh, we've got to pay attention here too. We are uh, assuming at this point that we will continue to pool our power supply with the laboratory as we have been doing for the last almost 35 years. That complicates the planning a little bit, but it also opens up some other opportunities. Um, we assume that electric demand will increase. Uh, it's been pretty stable for the last 20 years, but electric vehicles are starting to come in. And as I just mentioned, we're gonna be moving to electric heat. Um, so that demand is going to go up. We are looking at carbon-free power sources, uh, of course. Uh, solar, wind, nuclear being the most obvious, 
Uh, you can't really talk about solar and wind without talking about storage. That's really the, the bigger and bigger issue and more expensive issue right now. Um, costs for, for solar and wind are coming down, costs for storage are coming down, but they're, they're both still quite significant, particularly the storage part. Uh, we are cons recommending that we consider limiting any market purchases, that is purchases beyond the resources that we own and control to carbon-free sources. Uh, presumably as the market uh, grows and develops, there'll be more of those available. There's not much available right now, but there should be more. Um, renewable resources, the solar and wind anyway, not, not the nuclear, but the solar and wind tend to be more intermittent and we will need a broader and robust intermittency management strategy so it keeps your lights on. Uh, everybody's used to having power 24 seven whenever you flip the switch and that ought to be the standard that is continued. There are some circumstances whereby uh, it's more efficient to do uh, solar energy at utility scale, but in other cases there are advantages to doing it on your rooftop and doing storage right at your home too. And we've looked into uh, that and have several recommendations related to that. Next slide, please. Transportation, another biggie. Um, a lot of these things you know already. Uh, we need to encourage people to use more public transportation uh, or carpool. You know, the single occupancy vehicle is really quite wasteful. Uh, we, of course, over time, uh, there will be more electric vehicles in the fleet, uh, in, in, in the entire community. We uh, really are encouraging fleets to adopt them, the county fleet, the Atomic City Transit, public schools, et cetera. But uh, to use electric vehicles, the, infra the charging infrastructure needs to be broadened in a number of different ways, We're talking about that. Uh, the no idling uh, idea has already been suggested. We are suggesting a no idling policy discouraging people from, from just sitting and idling their vehicles while they're waiting in a parking lot or whatever. Um, the, uh, uh, and of course, it's better for both our health and the environment to bicycle and walk wherever possible. But that uh, we'd like to further improve our bike lanes and bike paths. We are suggesting trying to establish a bike path between White Rock and Los Alamos that's not on uh, Highway 4 and uh, potentially launching a bike share program here. And of course, there's little things like converting small engines like uh, lawnmowers and so forth to electric, otherwise fossil free also. Next slide. Uh, in the waste consumption, et cetera area, Sue has covered a lot of the first part of this, um, there, there, but, but it's broader even than what she covered. She covered food. Uh, there's a lot of individual, uh, uh, choices that we all make and everybody makes different choices and we don't want the government to have to dictate the choices that you make. We want you to have everybody to have choice, but we'd like to give people the tools to make those choices intelligently on their own. Um, we Sue talked about reducing waste and uh, Sue and Katie both did, so I won't talk any more about that. But we also need to look at water, both conserving its use, which has been mentioned some. Then there's managing the watershed and managing stormwater runoff, uh, which is a major issue in a number of respects. Uh, there's mani managing our natural areas, you know, the forests around us and the parks. Um, vegetation absorbs CO2. So that's uh, natural carbon sequestration, captures carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Next slide. Uh, there are some things we can do from the kind of the planning and zoning perspective. Uh, we don't have to invent building codes from whole cloth. There are building codes internationally adopt, uh, planned and adopted and are accepted, and we just need to adopt them. We may need to stretch those a little bit to meet our own local circumstances. We'll see. Um, we would like to institute some kind of a program where uh, energy efficient retrofits on existing homes could be financed uh, basically by a loan from the county through utilities, which you pay back through your utility bill, but uh, the New Mexico Constitution anti-donation clause at least complicates if does not stops that thing. We're still trying to figure that one out. 
One suggestion we are making is to include um, commercial zoning in each area of town, like each Mesa, for instance. So of course that doesn't create businesses, but we're hoping that with some commercial land, some small businesses anyway might establish themselves in places other than just downtown uh, that not only serve as community gathering places, but maybe people don't have to make as many trips downtown to uh, get a cup of coffee or whatever. So that's amongst our uh, recommendations. Um, our full report should be out in less than two weeks. And uh, I hope that you'll look at it when it comes out. Thank you. Katie. Thanks, Robert. Um, we'd like to go ahead and do the next slide. Um, the last thing we just want to advocate is that uh, change starts at home, but it also takes governmental change to make things happen policy right so please talk to your local lawmakers talk to your state and national representatives email them let them know that you care and that it matters. Um, and, and that's really where the big change is going to start. Um, so these will be put into a PDF and sent out with like the little evaluation at the end. Um, so you should be able to access this. You can also Google them, of course, um, but it's, it's important to contact people. Next slide. Um, now's the time for questions. If you've been saving them up, you can put them in the chat. Uh, we're very happy to take your questions and then we'll do the drawing for the cookbooks. Um, so we'll just give people a, a second to think about their questions, type them in. Um, as we're doing this, I do want to say that I thought I had four vegetarian cookbooks, but I actually have three vegetarian cookbooks and then this little guide about how to become vegan. And I want to tell you that all of these are being given a second life. I got them at the Friends of the Library bookstore here in town. Um, so we are doing that reduce, reusing, repurposing, regifting type thing here. Um, not seeing any other questions. Somebody did ask about almond milk um, and they've heard that it's really bad for the environment. And it's true that almonds take a lot of water, like crazy amounts of water. But if you compare that to beef, it's not as bad. Um, so my, my personal response to that is we do what we can. Um, you know, vegans fly in airplanes, uh, people who own electric vehicles eat meat. Um, some of us walk and ride the bus, some of us don't, but we do other, we plant gardens and we reduce our water use and all kinds of things. And so um, I know that I carry a lot of guilt about my carbon footprint, but I am really trying to just try to live <laughs> and do the things I can and that I have control over. And um, I've taken an active part in the community. I'm on the Lara's task force. And um, that's part of my trying to get things moving at more of a, a bigger policy level. So um, do what you can. Try not to feel too guilty about what you're not doing. Uh, the important part is to start somewhere. Um, it um, Katie, look, we do yeah. have a few questions over on this side. Oh, sure. Super. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first, somebody asked about getting um, a copy of that calculations for the home carbon footprint. Um, if it's all right with you, Katie, and the rest of the task force, I'll include this whole PowerPoint in that survey email so people can keep an eye out for that. Yep, that's great. Um, question, fuel cells sound great, but where do they get the hydrogen? That is the best question. And while I could answer it, I'm going to let Dan answer Okay, so um, right now, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on talking about where do you get or sources of hydrogen. There's a lot of stuff about blue hydrogen, which would be um, using methane as the source of hydrogen with carbon sequestration. Now, I'm just going to put on my own personal hat, and I'm not talking about any sort of uh, larger thing. The best way to make hydrogen is through electrolysis. And the best way to do electrolysis is with renewable energy. So if, you, um, if you're using renewable energy, you've basically closed the loop. You've, you're storing that renewable energy so you can use it when you need it. And then you're only producing water as a, as a product of the whatever energy you're doing or whatever. So electrolysis is when you take electrical energy and you use it to split water from into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. You'd collect the hydrogen gas and you'd store it. 
Uh, there's actually a really big uh, project going on in Delta, Utah right now, where they're going to be um, storing huge quantities of hydrogen in um, salt domes that are available up in Utah. They're also available in New Mexico. So given enough, um, given enough electrical energy, if we just build out uh, electrical infrastructure, we can make completely clean hydrogen. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers people's question. All right, another question. Um, somebody was asking about the um, recycling plastic bags at Smith. Uh, they're located in Albuquerque. I would love to know if we know where they can recycle those plastic bags in Albuquerque. Yeah, I think there are Smith's locations in Albuquerque. Um, I. I think other grocery stores recycle those too, but I can't say that all of them do. Um, the other thing you can put in that, anything that you can kind of push your finger through a little bit counts as one of those soft plastics. So like Amazon mailers, like those white and light blue prime ones, um, those can be recycled, but if it's like paper on the outside and the bubble in the middle, those can't be recycled because they can't separate those materials at the MRF. Um, I hope that answers that question. And I just want to say one other thing about the hydrogen is if you're using electrolysis and your source of energy is renewable, wind or solar or something like that, then it's like zero carbon. Um, doesn't mean there aren't other things, but um, it's, it's a really good way to do that. Um, so you do have to think about where your electricity comes from. If you're burning coal to run the plant to make your hydrogen, that's not as clean as it seems. So I just wanted to say that. Next. All right, um, recycling. Despite what the app says, I keep hearing that almost nothing in the US actually gets recycled. It goes to ABQ, but almost all recycled material now goes to landfills since China stopped taking paper and plastics. What actually is recycled? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that. Um, what I do know is that our recycling from Los Alamos gets sent to Albuquerque. Some, some things have a market, really it depends on if there's a market for it, right? Um, and so like when I used to live in Oregon, they only would take plastic bottles and jugs. They wouldn't take your yogurt containers or your raspberry clamshell. I mean, any of it, it was just like the worst feeling like I'm throwing all the stuff away. Um, but if you're recycling it and it's just gonna to go to the landfill anyway, that's just expensive trash. So that kind of made me rethink, well, gosh, am I gonna buy raspberries anymore? I learned to make my own yogurt so that I wasn't using those containers. You can make the argument, just stop eating yogurt and dairy in general, um, but I wasn't ready to do that. Um, so in terms of what is actually recycled, I don't know if there's anybody on the task force who does know better, Sue might be the right person for this. Um, but the truth is some of it just gets stored in Albuquerque in a big warehouse and they're waiting for a market to open up. Um, we're, I'm sorry? Metal. Metals, are, metals are definitely recycled. Thank you, Dan. Uh, metals and glass are probably like the biggies. Um, corrugated cardboard is another one. Um, you see these big like veiled things outside of supermarkets and restaurants and things. Um, so corrugated cardboard, glass, and metal are probably the big ones. Um, but in terms of the plastic, probably not much of it, to be honest. If you're interested in podcasts, there's one called How To, number two, Save the Planet. Um, and they have a whole thing about recycling and like how it works and what's good. And anyway, it's a very informative thing. Um, does anybody want to add to that question, Sue, or, or anybody? You, you covered much of it. And... Um... The last that I had heard, it, and just to reiterate what you said, where for our recycling from Los Alamos, which goes to um, re, to to Albuquerque to Friedman Recycling, again, they they my understanding is that they don't send things to the landfill; they stockpile it until a market is found for it, and I believe that's part of our contract as well. Our glass goes up to Coors in Golden, Colorado, to be made back into beer bottles. Um, aluminum is always recyclable. Uh, other metals, as you mentioned, corrugated cardboard. Plastics are the hard thing. Um, and generally those are 
not recycled as much as they are downcycled. So um, they're turned into a lesser product. They're not turned back into food containers and that sort of thing. Um, they're turned into something something else um, that's that's a lower quality product. One important thing to do though is if you if you I mean there's there's no way around some of this packaging. Uh, it's just a fact of life. And so um, so reduce the amount of packaging that you that you get, as Katie pointed out, you can you can find workarounds, make your own yogurt, that sort of thing. Um, but also buy recycled material. So if you have the option to buy recycled plastic or you, um, Patagonia is now making beautiful outerwear out of 100% recycled plastic that they get from water bottles. Make a market for these things and recycling will, will, will work. <laughs> if there's no market for these items, recycling will not work. Um, so that's, that's the other thing that you can do um, if, you, if you care about recycling. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks a lot. Katie, could I add one more thing about the cardboard? Uh, of course you can. Because that's one that, uh, so there's separate bins, big bins, you know, for the cardboard. And actually, so if you if you actually are just driving around anyway and you have, that's what I, I do is I just take my cardboard boxes that I get. I try to not get too many, but I just drop them off into the bins because that actually has a higher value and actually does get, you can feel good about those because those actually do get recycled. And one of the interesting tidbits about the general recycling stream is that one of the reasons why we get money for it is because it has some cardboard in it, but it doesn't get as much money if it was just the pure cardboard. So uh, I think that's a, a pretty simple thing. If, you know, again, it's a habit thing is if you, you want to save a few boxes, it's a lot easier to throw everything in the blue bin. But if you got, if you got a minute or two when you're driving by those gigantic bins and, and they and there's some around the community too so like there's one up here on north mesa so um i just thought that that was always interesting when i've heard that yeah thanks um i'm sort of notorious in our house for saving cardboard boxes and then putting them on facebook for people who are like moving or packing dishes or whatever and um we have this stockpile of boxes in our carport and then we have none and then we have 20 and then we have none. So you don't have to be like me, but um, that is another option too. Um, Ashley, are there any other questions we can answer? Yes, we have two more questions. Okay. Um, I'd like to see more child safe bike lanes around the elementary schools. How can we go about this? Oh my gosh, you totally are speaking to me right now. Um, I used to live in Corvallis, Oregon, which is like super green granola type community. And they have all these like very designated school zone bike lanes type things. And they have these little bike programs, which I think do exist in our schools too, to be fair. Um, while I think we do a good job in our community about bike lanes, there are definitely improvements that can be made. Um, you can advocate to both the county council and the transportation board. Uh, the T-board actually has a really great specific bicycle transportation plan that they've produced, which has all kinds of really good recommendations. Um, one thing that the Lares task force is recommending is to green box them. Um, if you've been in other communities, they have this kind of like thermal plastic that they put in the bike lane that's bright green and it makes them much more visible. And I think that's way safer for both drivers and bikers. Um, and so that is one thing that we're putting in there, but just send an email to a couple people and say, hey, we should do this. Um, and that, that might make all the difference. Thanks for the question. Yeah. And then our last question for tonight, um, what is the best way to get an energy audit? Well, I am, it's like this question was planted. Uh, I'm so glad you asked. The county is actually, they just hired a person. I can't, an energy, I can't remember what the title is. Uh, Councilor Wrighty, can you remember that off the top of your head or maybe Robert, you know? was conservation coordinator or something like that. Thank you. Conservation coordinator who is going to be doing exactly those types of things. Um, Larez has suggested that maybe we hire more people to do that as well, um, but that will get us started. And so I would say contact the county, uh, poke the new conservation coordinator and get started on your home audit. And you will not only save money, but you'll be reducing your emissions too. That person doesn't report a board, I don't believe until next month. So might not okay, want so to maybe wait. <laughs> wait, maybe wait. Quite that quite immediately. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Um, 
Okay, um, it, our, our LARES task force email is on the screen. It will be included in the packet, the PDF that gets sent out to you. Um, if you do have any feedback or questions, please feel free. Um, the other thing is our report will be available to the public, I think as soon as it's submitted to County Council, uh, which is February 1st. And so um, we encourage you to read it, to ask questions, to contact us, to, to advocate at the county, hey, this is great if you think it's great. Um, if you don't, then maybe don't. Uh, but um, anyway, we're, we're interested in your feedback. Last slide, please. Um, or I guess second to last slide. We do have one more event planned for February 3rd. The plan is to have an in-person sort of like fix it type thing. Bring your jeans, we'll patch them. Maybe we'll make some beeswax wraps for food or we'll do your carbon footprint calculation on a little laptop there. Uh, we have lots of um, different activities planned. And then there's COVID. So stay tuned on the PEAK website. We may cancel, we may delay. Um, we'll just see where that goes. And then those food waste reduction kits, they're really amazing. I learned tons from receiving mine. Um, they're available at the peak. And if they run out, I will bring more. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And please make sure to look out for that um, oncoming survey email along with the copy of this PowerPoint. Um, keep an eye out for our decision on the third part of this series, hopefully we'll be able to have um, a great program at some point in the future, even if it is not on the current set date. Thanks again to everyone and have a great night.